And I've always joked about how, you know, whenever you're a Christian, you're not cheap, you're a good steward. <laughs> but the reality is, I think, the reason that I don't want to talk about money is because I'm so tight-fisted whenever it comes to money. And I don't know why. I don't know why that is. I don't know if subconsciously I'm afraid that I won't have enough of it. I don't know if I've just never had enough to really spend it like I was silly, crazy. Maybe it just makes sense to me. <laughs> don't spend your money. Or maybe, maybe deep down, at a certain level, I find comfort and having money. And I'm afraid, maybe, that if I spend it, I'm going to lose that comfort. Isaac, I need the computer, please. You see, I'm of the belief that Christians should be the most generous individuals when it comes to money. Because we recognize that the money isn't ours, that it's God's, and that God uses our money to bless others. And whenever I say that, I don't mean that we're to be wasteful, but just the fact that what we have really isn't ours. We're in the fourth week of God's at war. Up to this point, Stan has, has talked about the battleground of idolatry, which is our hearts. We are all created with the capacity to worship something, but we are bent by our sinful nature. So usually what we begin to worship, it's easy for us to worship anything other than the one true God whom we are created to worship. He's, he's talked about two main gods thus far. Two weeks ago, he's talked about the God of pleasure. And then last week, he talked about the God of love. And if you missed any of those, or if you want to hear them again, you can find them. Uh, we've got them on YouTube, and so I encourage you to check those out. But really, prior to diving into our message, it would be beneficial to just sort of redefine or define again what an idol is. An idol is anything that we crave or seek after or trust in more than we crave or seek after or trust in God. Uh, essentially what happens is we make good things godly things. We take the gifts that God has given us, pleasures, people, performance, we take those things and we elevate them to such a point that we find our identity in them and then we want that more than we want God. Again, God gives us certain things to enjoy. He is a good father. He gifts us and he gives us and he, he, he allows us to enjoy things. I mean, all of us are evil and we know how to give good gifts to our children, as Jesus said. So how much more will God give you a good gift and he is very good, ultimately good. And this is where money falls into. Money falls into this category. It, money is not evil in and of itself. Money is, is not immoral. It is amoral. It is lacking morality. And so what you do with it, and it's how you use it, determines whether it's good or bad. And so everything I say this morning falls within this category. Money is not evil. In fact, we're told enjoying your money is a gift. Solomon observes, moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. So having more money than someone else should not make you feel guilty. Having less money than somebody else should not make you feel envious. Now, I don't know, because I, I'm not God. I'm not going to tell you that God wants you to be rich or that God wants you to be poor. I'm also not going to tell you that if you, if you give more, you're going to get more from God because God wants you to be rich. I think that if you are giving to God in order to get more from God, you're, you're abusing the system. It's, you're making it into some kind of get-rich-quick scheme. And I don't know if anybody actually does that. I don't believe so in this building. But there are people who believe, hey, if I throw a lot more to God, he's going to throw a lot more back at me. 
And so it's nothing to do with the, the generosity, but it's just so that they can get more. One commentator observed, money is a great servant, but a monster of a master. Now the Bible really does talk a lot about money. Probably because money is one of those things that has the potential to not only captivate you, but to seduce you and to lead you away from the faith. In fact, that is... That's something that Paul tells Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy in his first letter, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we have brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. And Paul says this often misquoted verse, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Note, it's the love of money that is the root, not the money itself. He says some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So I want to zero in on something that Jesus said. Because in reality, he, he did talk about money more than heaven and hell. He did talk about money more than prayer. And, and it's because, not because Jesus is greedy, right? Everything in the earth, everything in the world belongs to him. But it's because he understands the power that is found there within money. And he understands how fickle we are at times. This single verse also captured in Matthew's account, Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. This really doesn't need any kind of expounding upon. It makes sense. You can't serve two individuals. You can't serve both God and money. And even if money and God are going along the same path and you're, you're easily following after, eventually the two are going to split and you're going to have to decide which way am I going to go? Am I going to follow after Christ or follow after the money? And I wonder... I wonder if, if maybe the reason people get uncomfortable or frustrated or they don't want to hear a sermon about money, maybe it's because they serve it more than they serve God. Maybe we get uncomfortable or upset whenever the sermon is on money because we don't want to loosen our grip on what is ours. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But you see, whenever you serve money, you are willing to put everything else second. Your spouse, your children, your friends, your hobbies, yourself, and most damaging of all, your God. And I think it's really easy for us in, in America to justify our service to money because we, we describe it in, in good statements. Well, I'm, I'm supposed to provide. And listen, family, I'm, I'm working night and day, extra weekends, missing vacations, missing sporting events because it's my job as a father to provide. Or else we say, I'm just doing my job. My work schedule is crazy. It's just my job. I have no control over it. Or we say, I'm pursuing my dream. I'm doing what I love and so sorry, I, I can't help it. But, and maybe all of that is true. I don't know your situation, but at what cost? I know my dad was grieved by the, the work that he had to do whenever us boys were growing up because the town that he, he lived in, we lived in, it provided nothing for him that would, that would support his family. And so he was an over-the-road truck driver. He hated it. He missed out on a lot of stuff. And I was telling the men on Thursday nights, to this day, if, if Cat Stevens' Cats in the Cradle comes on, this, on the radio, he changes it. 
Because it reminds him of himself. And so at what cost are you pursuing what you're pursuing? Again, as Paul says, some people eager for money have wandered away from the face and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let's just say you're not going to leave Jesus by chasing the money, but let's say you are going to pierce yourself, your family, those around you with many griefs. So why do people chase money? Why, how does money even become an idol? Well, money becomes an idol because we believe certain myths concerning money. That we believe that money will satisfy me. We, we've all heard money won't make you happy, but we've all convinced ourselves that that's what rich people tell us in order to make sure that we're not miserable. That's a lie. We think that if, if only we had enough, if only we had a little bit more, if only we had this, then we'd be set, we'd be happy, we'd be content. And there are a couple of you in the room probably thinking, man, but I'd sure like to try it. <laughs> just give me one shot, God. Let me just try it. <laughs> but would you really? I mean, how many horrible stories have you read about people who, who either were instantly wealthy beyond their dreams, or else how many people who are born into wealth or work their way up and get wealthy and they're still not happy. They're still chasing after something else. John D. Rockefeller was once asked, how much does it take to satisfy a man completely? His reply, it takes a little bit more than what he has. Money will not satisfy us, yet we believe it will. Another myth is my self-worth is determined by my net worth. This past summer, <laughs> I had so many teenagers give me flack about my cell phone. Man, your phone is so old! First off, it's two and a half years old. I bought it brand new when we moved to Iberia. <laughs> it is not old, <laughs> you hear me? But man, your phone is so old. No, it's not. They say, man, your phone is so, so huge and so small. They say, I bet my phone is faster than your phone. Yeah, it probably is. Unless I throw it at you. <laughs> I bet my phone, this was actually said a couple of weeks ago by somebody in this room. I won't mention Ethan's name because I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> but he said, I bet my phone has more memory than your phone. I said, I bet it does. I barely can keep pictures on this thing. What do you mean? <laughs> I said, if I want to put on an app, I've got to delete a bunch of pictures. <laughs> said, hey, can you even get on the internet with that thing? Yes, I can. <laughs> I just got to uh, open up my Wi-Fi first and make sure I'm within a network that I know the password for. <laughs> and obviously that didn't bother me because I understand that my phone is not me. I understand that my phone serves me and, and, and if it's doing what I want it to do, I mean, who cares if I can't get proper emojis, right, Stan? <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even know what an emoji is. <laughs> The point being is that should be our attitude to the things that we have, and yet instead we look at our neighbors or our co-workers or, or our friends at school and we think that they're some of the most annoying people that we can find in the world because they're going on multiple vacations or they just got a new car or a, a brand new lawnmower or a new iWatch or, or a tracking system or whatever. And we go, man, I want that. I need that. I just, I just, I'm not me unless I have it. But yet, as Christians, we find our identity in Christ, not in our stuff, not in, not in our material possessions, not in our bank account. Our identity is in Christ. And so we can't base our happiness on what's in the bank or what's setting in the car or the barn don't be like Bernard Shaw who said, the lack of money is the root of all evil. 
not the love of it. Another myth that we believe is that there is security with having money. But this security that my money provides is incredibly seductive. It's seductive because it's tangible, right? You can hold in your hand everything you owe, own or else look on your bank account or, or check something out and you're able to say, oh man, look at what I have. I'm set for life. But for those of you, if you are involved in the stock market, you know that the stocks fall overnight. You know that. Whenever we were going to move to Texas, I, I don't know why, but I had, uh, I had a couple hundred dollars in a CD case stored in my glove compartment of my truck. I don't know where, I don't remember why, I don't know, but I just remember one day, I like, man, I gotta, I gotta clean that truck up. And so I did. I, I cleaned things up, I threw stuff away, and it was, I don't know, a couple months later, we were in Texas, and I go, well, I've got some money in the truck. We were needing money. And I go to the truck. There was no money there. I threw a couple hundred dollars away into the burn barrel and it burned up. Oops. <laughs> There's no security with having money. The life of Charles M. Schwab, uh, Schwab demonstrates this. Back in his day in the early 20th century, his company became the largest independent steel producer in the world. And he received medals, he received fame, and he became crazy wealthy. So much so that he moved to New York City and rewarded himself, get this, he rewarded himself with a mansion that was worth $7 million at the time. He also owned estates and traveled in, in an expensive private rail car. But over several years, he spent almost all of his fortune, which was estimated between 25 and 40 million at the time, so adjusted for inflation, about 800 million today, spent all of that. And what money he hadn't squandered by 1929, he lost in the stock market crash. His home was seized, and at the time of his death, he was in debt, and his holdings were worthless. In fact, he had to borrow money in order to make ends meet. There is no true security in wealth. A final myth that we believe is that money will save me. Kyle Eidelman writes, The real problem with idolatry is that we look to something other than Jesus for salvation. We're lonely and we look to a relationship for salvation. We're empty and we look to possessions for salvation. We're depressed and we look to food for salvation. We're rejected and we look to pornography for salvation. We're angry and we look to alcohol for salvation. We're apathetic and we look to our work for salvation. We're proud and we look to status for salvation. We're worried. And we look to money for salvation. I, I teased this thought a moment ago, and so I want to return to it to begin to wrap up. My question was, do you think we get uncomfortable, or do you think people get uncomfortable whenever the sermon is about money because we don't want to loosen our grip on it? Have you ever seen a beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed angel of a girl turn into a raging, demon-possessed terror? I have. <laughs> Do you remember what set her off? Someone trying to take her prized possession. And the last words she screamed, can you hear it? It was a single word, single syllable. The word was, mine. Mine! Mine! It would seem that th this is our thought whenever it comes to our money. Not the raging demon-possessed terror aspect, but the fact that it's mine. The unrestricted, authoritative, absolute belief that what is in our pocket, what is in our bank account is mine. 
I mean, this is why so many of us hate taxes, because the government says, hey, give me what is yours. You work hard for your money. And that's the, the key in that statement, right? Your money. You work hard for it. But the question is, is it really yours? Well, the answer depends on who your God is. To keep money in its proper place, we have to acknowledge that it doesn't belong to us. And this is true whether we're a Christian or we're not a Christian. But if we're not a Christian, we're not going to acknowledge that God is sovereign over what is His. But whenever we are Christians, we need to acknowledge that. By sovereignty, by God's sovereignty, I mean that He, he exercises complete ownership of what is His. All things under His domain. Psalm 24, 1 through 2 says it plainly, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters, all who live in it and everything that they claim is their own. Elsewhere, Scripture talks about how the cattle on the hills are His. We can say the crops out in the field are His. What's in your driveway is His. Your children, children, your parents, they are all God's property. And that also means our money is His money. But so many times, we're like Charlotte. Charlotte was an older lady who wanted to be prepared in case she was ever confronted by the evil in the world. She was by herself. She lived alone. And so one day, after she had finished shopping at the grocery store, that moment uh, that she had been preparing for was upon her. She gets to her car, and in the car there are four men that are trying to steal her vehicle. So she drops her groceries. She pulls a gun out of her purse, and she says, Get out of my car! <laughs> And of course, they, they run. They jump out. They go ter running away, terrified. She's shaking from the adrenaline, but she's feeling very proud of what she's just done. She puts her groceries in the car. She sits down. She goes to put her key in the ignition, but it doesn't turn on. <laughs> she then looks down the aisle, and she realizes that her car was a few spaces up. <laughs> So she does what any sensible person would do. She drives to the police station to turn herself in. But see, so many of us feel like Charlotte whenever it comes to our money. It's ours, and we need to hold on to it tight. We need to be defensive, protective. And maybe to a point that's true. I don't know. But the idea that, that we believe the money is ours, it's not true. It belongs to God. The truth of money is that it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And whenever you get down to God's money and you, notice the way that I strung those words together, God's money and you, not you and God's money, or not you, your money and God. The question is not, what can I do in order to make myself more comfortable? The question is, how can I learn to trust God to take him at his word that he will provide for my needs. At one point in the Old Testament, God reveals himself as Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. So if you believe that today, I challenge you to view all that you own in light of that. Take God at his word and allow him to provide. So let me conclude with a story. A song team can come up. Uh, there was once a man that came to Jesus and he, and, he, and he says, Jesus, what do I need to do in order to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, son, you just, you know the commandments. Obey them, follow them. Uh, the young man is, is happy and, and he's confident and he goes, man, I've done all that. Jesus says, you lack one thing. Go sell your possessions. Give all your money away and follow me then you will have eternal life. The man's face is downcast. He walks away saddened. The man loved what he had more than he loved who he could follow. 